announcements. Uh, so let me, uh, let me just pray for our time, uh, and then let's ask for the Lord's blessing upon us as we turn to His Word this morning. Okay, so let's pray. Father, we thank You for the privilege it is to gather as those who have been redeemed by the work and the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, as we meet this morning to offer our worship in response to who you are and what you've done, we pray that, Lord, you would help us to set aside any distractions that we might have from the week and even for this morning, that we would be able to come before the throne of grace with clean hands and a pure heart. And so, Lord, we want to be able to commit to you our time now. We ask that you would give us just eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts ready and eager to receive your word this morning. We pray that you'd speak powerfully to us through your word so that we might be changed into the likeness of your son, Jesus Christ. We pray these things in his name. Amen. Well, this morning, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to invite you to take them and turn with me to the letter of Philippians. We are continuing our study through this letter. And for this morning, our passage can be found in Philippians chapter 4. And we'll be looking at verses 10 through 13 for our time together this morning. And as is our custom here, if you are able, let us stand in honor and reverence for the reading of God's word. Philippians chapter 4. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. This is God's holy word. You may be seated. According to Bible Gateway, the second most popular verse next to John 3.16 is Philippians 4.13, which we just read. And it is arguably the most quoted verse in pop culture. And yet it is also, at the same time, one of the most misquoted verses in our day. I first came across this verse during a boxing match between Evander Holyfield and Mike Tyson, who was the heavyweight champion of the world at that time. And Holyfield was an overwhelming underdog in this fight. But as a professing Christian, he talked about having faith. He came out to gospel music that evening. And as he was going to the ring, he came to the ring with his purple robe and shorts and inscribed on them was Philippians 4.13. My uncle and I who were watching the fight didn't know what the reference was. And so he looked it up in his Bible and he read the verse aloud. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I remember my uncle saying, oh, he's going to win now, right? <laughs> sure enough. Holyfield went on to beat Mike Tyson, who was heavily favored to win that night. And he would be among the many since to then famously use this verse in the context of sports and competition. We've seen this with Tim Tebow with Philippians 4.13 and eye black on his face. Or Steph Curry writing, I can do all things on his shoes. Or John Jones, who fights in the UFC, he has his verse tatted on his chest. Philippians 4.13 functions as a, a kind of mystical force for people where they recite it when they need to draw power from another place to defeat an enemy, to conquer a task or achieve success. And it's not just for celebrities or, or athletes or nominal Christians. I imagine for those here, like many other Christians, You've claimed this verse at one time in your life as a way to gain what you desire most. And yet what I want to suggest to you is that what Paul says here is far more expansive, far more beautiful, far more satisfying than some prosperity interpretation of this verse where you can name it and claim it and do anything. 
Instead, this is a promise of contentment. See, Paul wasn't saying that we would win games and have some great performance. He wasn't saying that we would have success in all our personal endeavors. He wasn't saying that we can have whatever we set our minds to because Christ is this enabling force in our lives. Now, what Paul is testifying to is that regardless of whether you win or lose, succeed or fail, have plenty or are in want, you can have something better. You can have contentment. Because you have Christ who is our strength, but who is also our ultimate satisfaction. So that Paul's words here actually promise to deliver far more than we allow ourselves to hope. Because if there's one quality that all of us lack, it's contentment. It's been said that it is the most ex- elusive of all virtues next to humility. It's why it's been called the rare jewel of the Christian life by Puritan Jeremiah Burroughs. Because we live in such a dis- discontented culture where our pursuit is always after what's better. We want a better job with better pay and a better boss. We want a better home and a better car. We want better friends and a better spouse and better kids. We want a better body and better hair, better hair, a better style, a better appearance. And marketers and advertisers and businesses, they understand discontentment. They bank on the hopes that they can get you to take your eyes off of what you have so that you can focus on what you don't have. They know those who live by the glass half empty model of life, are on a never ending journey to be filled. It's why discontentment is a multi billion dollar industry. See, we live in a world where we're taught to believe that more is never enough. And how we measure ourselves and how we define success and how we regard our worth is based on how we're doing in comparison to others. But the truth is, that kind of thinking only results in disappointment and disillusionment and ultimately dissatisfaction. And this is why most of us possess so much and yet we enjoy what we have so little. And yet when the Apostle Paul, he wrote this letter, he was in the direst of circumstances. He was in prison for the faithful proclamation of the gospel. He was chained to a Roman soldier around the clock. He was awaiting trial. He was under tremendous pressure to change the form of his ministry or lose his life. He had been ridiculed and slandered not only by enemies but by other believers. And so there he was living in captivity, in chains, despised by the world and criticized by the church. He's lost his freedom, his livelihood, his home, his community, his friendships, and even his reputation. In the midst of that kind of situation, he says, I'm content. I have learned in whatever situation, I am to be content. Paul writes to these believers knowing that they were going through some difficult circumstances of their own. And he understands the temptation to respond with discontentment. And so he offers himself as an example, not only to these Philippian believers, but to all believers of contentment in our discontented world. And so this morning, we're going to look at this topic of contentment, and specifically, how can we be content? And what does it look like? What are practical ways for us to cultivate this virtue in our lives? And similar to last week, this will be more of a a topical message than an expositional sermon, but I trust that it'll be helpful and encouraging and practical for our church And so for our time together, I want to look at several truths about contentment and for how we can have it. First, if you're taking notes, I want to talk about the problem of contentment. 
there's a pervasive belief that changing our circumstances is what will make us content. Living in a different place, having a different job, being surrounded by different people, having a better environment, having a different partner, having freedom from problems. Uh, We're convinced that contentment is ultimately a circumstantial problem. But notice what Paul says here in verse 11. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. This is a man who is in prison, awaiting possible execution because of false charges made by corrupt officials. He is a victim of a miscarriage of justice, and yet the apostle testifies to a contentment that he has which transcended his circumstances. If you remember, the Philippian church had sent a financial gift to Paul during this time. He writes this letter to express his heartfelt thanks to them, but at the same time, he he doesn't want them to think that the Lord wasn't sufficient for his every need. That although he had been in a very difficult situation, he doesn't want his supporters to think that he had been discontent before the gift arrived. And so he talks about this contentment that he had, and by extension, all believers are to have. And it was one that wasn't dependent on the conditions of life. For Paul, contentment was an issue of the heart and not a result of circumstances. I love how the Puritan Jeremiah Burroughs defines contentment. He says this, that Christian contentment is that sweet inward, quiet, gracious frame of spirit, which freely submits to and delights in God's wise and fatherly disposal in every condition. It is the inward submission of the heart. That hits different because there's a tendency to point the finger when we're discontent. If I could just look skinny, then I would be content. If I could just be organized, then I'd be content. If my spouse would change and there'd be less fighting and he or she would love me in the way I want, then I would be content. If my children would just obey me the first time I asked, then I'd be content and nice. If my house were bigger and nicer and cleaner, then I can be content. See, discontentment is always pointing the finger at others and circumstances when in fact, The finger should be pointed at our hearts. The Bible ultimately teaches that contentment, it's a spiritual issue. It's not a circumstantial issue. Realize that the root of every sin is our seeking satisfaction in something other than God. This was, in fact, the first sin. If you go back to Genesis in the Garden of Eden, this was a temptation Satan says to the woman, you know why it is that God won't let you eat of the fruit of the garden? Well, let me tell you why. And he says this, it's because when you eat it, you will become like him, knowing good and evil. In other words, Satan was suggesting to Adam and Eve that God is withholding something from them, and they would be better off with that something. In other words, there is a satisfaction outside of God that God has withheld from them, and they would be more deeply satisfied if they had that thing that God has withheld that was outside of God, that was other than God. What Satan is saying to Adam and Eve is that God is not enough. There's more, and you can have it. Don't you see? That is exactly the lie that is told to you today. The world says, our culture says, Satan says, God is not enough. There is more. Go after those things. God is not worth living for. I can give you something better than God. And Eve and Adam, they go for it. It's like on one hand, it's God or this piece of fruit 
and they go for the fruit, and it just seems ridiculous. But that's what we do every time we sin. See, Satan has been running the same play since the beginning of time. It's the same play over and over. Disobey God and life will be better for you. In our sin, we try to fill that void, that emptiness, that thirst with things other than God. It doesn't even have to be overtly sinful things. As we talked about last week, these can be good things. But what the human heart does is it takes good things like academics, a a successful career, work, material possessions, pleasure, people, your family, and you turn these good things into ultimate things and you make them sinful things because they become more important things than God. They take the place of God in our lives. John Piper, he says this, that the greatest enemy of hunger For God, is not poison, but apple pie. The greatest adversary of love to God is not his enemies, but his gifts. And the most deadly appetites are not for the poison of evil, but for the simple pleasures of earth. See, this is the root of discontentment. Despite being made by God and for God, we tell God that we don't want you. We just want your stuff. We want your blessings. We want your relationships, secure finances, and occupational success. It is this pursuit of finding hope and happiness in the gifts rather than the giver, of finding meaning and significance in the creation instead of the creator, and finding contentment in the things of God rather than God himself. Jesus is saying is that if you live for those other things, and you seek other pleasures, you will always be left behind by pleasure. Why? Because joys, with the exception of God, come with an expiration date attached to them. It doesn't last. Everything in this world goes bad. It sours. It fades. You might experience momentary pleasure, but when security is taken away, when circumstances change, when people disappoint, when money and status aren't enough, when comfort perpetuates needing more comfort, when another trip leaves you seeking another high, satisfaction eludes us because they were never meant to fill the void. In the end, we're left empty and contentment is missing. Because contentment is never based on better circumstances. And so that's the problem of contentment. And so we have to ask, well, where does this leave us? Well, secondly, I want to talk about the source of contentment. And I want to tell you that the search for contentment is really a search for God. And it's only in Christ Will you be fully and finally content? And we go back to the text in Philippians 4, and and Paul tells us that the source and strength of his contentment is ultimately Christ. He says in verse 13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. As I already mentioned, this well-known verse is often misapplied from its context. It's not about having your dreams come true or your goals being met. Rather, it's being joyful and steadfast even when they don't. This verse isn't about winning the football game. It's about how you respond when you lose the game or you're injured for the season or fail to make the team altogether. It's not about getting the new house. It's about finding your satisfaction in the house you already have if your bid isn't accepted. This is not a verse about being empowered to change your circumstances. Rather, it's a verse about relying on God's power in order to be content in the midst of circumstances that you can't change. The reason why you can do this and be content is because Paul tells us it's because of Christ that you have him, that he is all you need, that he is our treasure. See, to to get to this place of contentment, it comes 
from not self-sufficiency, but Christ's sufficiency. That he is enough, that we are satisfied in him. Our Lord Jesus, he spoke to this on several occasions during his ministry. But he talked most extensively about this in John chapter 4. And I want to have you turn there to John chapter 4, to the familiar story of the woman at the well. And this story is really all about contentment. It's a story where Jesus teaches about contentment, but it's a story that illustrates contentment and what it can look like in a life of one who is truly content in Jesus. In this account, Jesus, he comes across this woman, and we get the sense that she's looking for something in life. Searching for something that will give her peace and satisfaction and happiness. Because as we learn, she's a a single woman who was a divorcee, who's been married five times, and is currently living with someone who is not her husband. This would be frowned upon even in our society, but in her culture, this was an abomination. And the fact that she comes in the middle of the day tells you that she understands this. She comes during the hottest time of day to most likely avoid the other women of the town. Her coming at that hour meant that she could avoid the abuse of the other women upon her immoral lifestyle, where she wouldn't have to hear the word whore whispered under their breaths. She could avoid the condescending stares. She could avoid their judgments in the comments. And yet, she continues to pursue relationships as a means to fulfillment, despite the social cost that it came with. With each new man, she's hoping this one would make her happy. This one would fulfill what's missing in her life. This one would love her as she wants to be loved. She believes that a change in circumstances and different relationships is what would make her content. And her longing for something is so great for this woman, it is better to be thought of as a pariah in her own society than to be lonely. She would rather be regarded as an adulterer and someone who sleeps around than be content in her singleness. But on this day, She has a life-changing encounter with Christ. And I want you to notice what our Lord says here. Jesus is wearied from his journey, is thirsty, and sits by the well. And he meets this woman and has this conversation with her. And he begins by asking her for a drink. It says in verse 9 of John 4, The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who is it that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. It seems a bit abrupt, uh, if not socially awkward. Like if you go to the coffee station after service and you ask Rayson for a drink of water and he says, I'll give you living water, then you'd be like, well, that's weird. Uh, can Curtis help me? Like, and so, I mean, it, it'd be kind of weird, right? What was Jesus doing here? He was illustrating this spiritual truth that her discontentment was a much deeper spiritual issue. And you think about the reference that he uses. He talks about water. Our Lord talks about water, and he's making a point that though we drink water every day, you will always thirst again. And you have to come back to this well time and time again. Because there's no water in the world that can fully and finally satisfy you. You and I will always thirst. And what Jesus is teaching here is the spiritual lesson that all of us thirst for something in life. But that thirst will never be quenched by the things of this world. See, the Bible teaches that we were created by God and for God. We were meant to obey him and find our joy and satisfaction in him. 
Blaise Pascal says that there's a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every man which cannot be filled by any created thing, but only by God, the creator, made known through Jesus Christ. You think about this. Why did God create beings like us to need food and water? Why do we have to hunger and thirst? Why is it that we have to have some sort of need in our life? God didn't have to make us this way. And I think he does so, so that we would have some idea of what the Son of God is like when he says, I am the bread of life and living water. He creates us to have capacities so that we would seek the one to whom we will be fully satisfied and whose goodness we have tasted in the gospel and it is enough. And it makes everything else leave us wanting for that which he alone can fill. See, Jesus wasn't offering to quench her physical thirst. He was talking about something so much more significant. The living water was about eternal life. He was going to quench her spiritual thirst. But in order to give the living water, Jesus would have to die for her sins and bear the punishment that she deserved and be raised on the third day so that he could offer eternal life to those who would believe him as Savior and Lord. And if you think about it, eternal life would have been enough for this woman to thank Christ for all of eternity. But grace upon grace, she would fully and finally Find the rest and peace and contentment that she'd been seeking all her life. And that's something of what happened to this woman here in this story. You notice what happens after she realizes who Jesus is and what he is saying. I love the picture here. It says in verse 28, So the woman left her water jar and went into town and said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? And they went out of the town and were coming to him. The the question here is, why point out that she left her water jar? From the surface, it seems like an inconsequential fact. It's like sharing about a momentous occasion in your life and mentioning that you ate Chick-fil-A for breakfast. Why share that? other than it being delicious, okay? I believe her leaving the water pot behind is a picture that the living water of Jesus was all she needed. But it was also a picture of her moving on from her old life and living a new life in Christ. We don't know exactly what her life was like after this, but we have an idea that for the first time, she found rest and contentment. And we know this because she shared Jesus to those she previously avoided. Despite the fact that her situation hadn't changed, that likely her place in society hadn't changed, despite the fact that people still shunned her, and they alienated her, and they judged her, she goes and tells them about Jesus. It was such a powerful testimony of her being truly satisfied in Christ, and that's all that mattered for her from that point forward. What it must have been like to not have to worry about what the other women thought of her anymore, because it was more important what God thought about her. What it must have been like to not have to pursue love and relationships because she had been loved by the Almighty. What it must have been like to not find her identity in what she has done and what Jesus was willing to do for her. Let me ask you this morning, is this a picture of your life today? Is this your story? Can God write this about you? Where like this woman, you've left behind your water pots because you've drunk deeply of living water. 
In other words, let me ask you, does your life show that you are truly satisfied in Christ? And I think for most of us as Christians, this is a struggle. It's not such a black and white thing of whether life is about Christ or about something else. See, our problem isn't that we reject Christ, it's that we want something in addition to Christ. It's the Jesus plus something kind of life. It's Jesus plus a comfortable life. It's Jesus plus good health. It's Jesus plus financial security. It's Jesus plus a significant other. It's Jesus plus occupational success. It's Jesus plus the approval and acceptance from certain people. It's Jesus plus pleasure. And I want to tell you that that kind of life is settling for second best. There is something better, someone better. And God is offering so much more. Don't settle for a Jesus plus something kind of life because it'll always leave you wanting for more. Like the woman in the story, leave your water pots behind and drink deeply of the living water and know the joy of being in relationship with Christ. Think for a moment about what that kind of life can look like. Think for a moment about what your life would be like when you're fully content in the Lord. Think about how work would be less consuming and not a means for identity, success, and security. But work is where you're able to live out your faith, to be a light, to steward your gifts and resources for God. Think about relationships, that what would life be like if the overriding thought in your heart wasn't, I need to be married, what if you simply rested in Christ? How would you be transformed? Think about not worrying about your image anymore and needing to put up pretense to look godly, but to instead embrace that you are a sinner who needs grace like everyone else. How freeing would that be? This contentment is offered to us, God tells us, if we would but grab hold of Jesus to be our satisfaction. This leads to our last point, the practice of contentment. If we go back to Philippians 4, there's an important statement that the apostle makes here. He says in verse 11 this, and I think we can easily overlook this. Not that I am speaking of being in need. He says, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. You see that? For those of us as believers who are asking, how do I get this kind of contentment that Paul had? This gives us a lot of encouragement that Paul the great apostle, the missionary, the one who planted the first churches, who authored a quarter of the New Testament, who met the Lord on the Damascus Road, who was taken up to the third heaven by Jesus, this same Paul had to learn contentment. It didn't come naturally. It didn't come quickly. It didn't come easily. But this was a process where Paul had to work at this. He had to grow in this virtue. So, It gives us hope because it means that we can grow in contentment as well. And so what can we learn from Paul for how we can grow to have contentment? Let me give you three things. Practice thankfulness. We see this in Paul's life that he practiced thankfulness. In Philippians 1, he says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in prayer of mine for you, all making my prayer with joy. If you remember, this entire letter is a thank you letter where the apostle, he expresses his thankfulness throughout it for these Philippian believers, for their gift, for their love, for Epaphroditus, for Christ, for the gospel, for what he had and what he didn't have, and for the Lord. It is It is a a letter full of thanks. As we approach this holiday season and we have conversations with one another, the question that many of us are asked and that we ask each other is usually how was your Thanksgiving? 
And, and when someone asks that question, we understand the question is about the celebration itself. We're asking about the who and the what and the when and the where of Thanksgiving and all the festivities of the holiday. But I think the more important question to ask isn't how was your Thanksgiving, but how is your Thanksgiving? And there's a difference there. Because we're not asking about meals and celebration and the event itself, but the nature of thanksgiving in our lives. The reason that we ought to do this is because throughout Scripture, we see that thanksgiving is a mark of the believer. It is of a life that has been transformed by the grace of God and the gospel. See, a content person is a thankful one. And a thankful person is one who is content. And so the question that I want to pose to you this morning is, how is your thanksgiving? Are you a thankful person? Is this a discipline in your life where you have a thankful spirit to the Lord? If you evaluate your prayer life, do you include in their regular thanksgiving to God in specific ways? See, this isn't just something that takes place once a year over a Thanksgiving meal, but it is a lifestyle where we give thanks to the Lord. And so for this to happen, the gospel must occupy center stage in our lives. We need to preach the gospel to ourselves. We need to remember that God's love in devising our our rescue from sin and death was something that was unmerited grace. We need to consider what Christ accomplished at the cross. We need to think about how God, he brought us to saving faith even when we don't deserve it. We need to remember God's gift of his spirit and of his word. We need to thank God for how he has protected and preserved us in ways we don't even realize. We need to recount how God has provided us with life and breath and food and drink, shelter and provision and all that we have. Thomas Watson warns that discontent it is an ungrateful sin because we have far more mercies than afflictions. If ever we're going to learn to be content, we must consciously and consistently turn ourselves to numbering our blessings and practicing thankfulness. Second, trust in God's providence. Christian contentment trusts in the providence of a wise, loving, and sovereign God. Paul had a settled conviction about who God was and that the Lord brought specific circumstances into his life for his good. And it's why the apostle was able to rejoice and be content. Let me make one clarifying point here that I think needs to be said as we're talking about contentment. Contentment doesn't mean complacency. As Christians, I want to tell you that we can work to better our circumstances as we have opportunity. If you're in an unpleasant job, or you're pursuing a relationship and a spouse, or you're wanting to move to another home, there's nothing wrong with doing those things, as long as it's done with godly motivations and in a sort of submission to God's will. But contentment is trusting that God uses difficult circumstances for our good. See, the Bible tells us that God doesn't only give us grace in our suffering, but that suffering itself is the grace that he uses to change and transform us. He uses difficult circumstances to show the idols in our hearts, to fight our sins, to grow our faith. Suffering is only suffering if we don't see God's purposes in it. And we have to realize that there are a thousand reasons for why God brings trials into our lives, some more apparent than others, some that will become more clear later on, some that we will only know in heaven. But there are a million things that God is doing right now in your situation, whether you know it or not. Uh, In a sense, it's kind of been thought of like this. It's like you're looking at the back of a tapestry of your life. And looking at the back, you can kind of see the picture, but it's, it's like a general table of dots and messy threads. You can't quite discern what it is. 
But one day, when you meet Christ, you will see the front of the tapestry, and it will be more beautiful than you can possibly think or imagine. And you'll realize why God had you in this season of life. So I, we need this kind of truth. We need to think about this kind of truth. We need to develop a, a more robust theology of suffering if we want to be content through the circumstances of life. Third and lastly, treasure Christ. And I empathize with you that it's hard to not longingly look at the life of others around you. It's hard to not longingly look at people's homes and their jobs and their family and opportunities they have and wealth and their children and ministry and friends and their stuff and their outward appearance. It's hard to not want what others have. It's hard not to compare, especially with social media today. It's hard not to treasure those things. But this is where we have to preach truth to ourselves, that those things can't satisfy because they weren't meant to. And the only thing, the one thing in this world that can, it is a relationship with Christ. And this idea that the world will not satisfy, this wasn't something that I understood growing up. I went to church in high school. I believed in God, but I had this notion of Christianity that Christianity was true, but not necessarily better. I followed Christ like other Christians, but the real joys were in the world. But it's as I came to learn more about who Jesus is, my eyes were open. That Jesus wasn't only right, but as we've been saying, he was better. He is the greatest good. He is our most valuable treasure, and we can count all things as loss in view of the surpassing greatness of knowing him. Some of you need to be reminded of that today. That when you have Jesus, you're going to be okay when in God's wisdom, he decides you need less of other things, when something precious is taken away, when he withholds what you want, you're going to be okay because Jesus is saying you have everything you need. It's me. For some of you, as we approach the end of the year, I know this has been a difficult year for some of you, but would you reminded Would you be reminded that your life is not going to be any less because you don't have the relationship you wanted when the bank account isn't where you want it to be, when you don't have the sort of job that you want or even a job for that instance in this season, when you're not in the season of life that you want to be, when you don't have the acceptance of certain people, when you don't have the pleasures of the world and the freedoms that unbelievers get to experience, life is not less full because we have been filled with the bread of life and living water. We live in a culture that says and tells us repeatedly and shouts to us that Jesus is not enough. And we of all people can proclaim by his grace, no, he is all we have, he is all we need, and he is enough. Let's go forth and live And proclaim that with our lives, that Jesus is enough. Let's pray. Father, we confess to you that so often we try to satisfy our longings and the things of life. And they can even be good things. But cause us to realize that it will always leave us wanting. Because that which we are to hunger for and thirst for cannot be filled in this world, but it can only be filled in Jesus Christ, who is the bread of life, who offers living water. Thank you for coming into our lives and pursuing us when we went after the world. And may those who are not believers come to know that the greatest, most satisfying and rewarding thing 
is to come to know and to love and to believe in Jesus. Lord, help us to preach the gospel to ourselves every day, to be reminded that you are good, that you are all satisfying. Lord, that you are enough. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.